Take a second to think about how much your life depends on the internet. All these activities are vulnerable to cyber criminals and malicious state actors who seek their own economic or political gains. Differences in regulatory, institutional and human capacities between countries make it easier for them to operate across borders. To protect openness and stability in cyberspace, we need to strengthen our capacities and close the accountability gap. Thank you for joining the session on accountability. My name is uh, Dennis Pruders. I am uh, an associate professor at Leiden University and I run the, the Hague program on uh, cyber norms. Um, I think we're still gathering the troops in terms of participants. So I'm not really sure how many people we have yet, um, but we have started. So I'll continue anyway. Um, if all is well, then uh, quite soon we should have a, a banner on, on Livecast um, directing you to a Menti website um, where we would ask you sort of in the coming half hour when the, uh, uh, when the original, uh, when the speakers sort of do their first thing um, to, to answer for us uh, three questions uh, uh, on, about yourself and uh, your idea on uh, the theme of accountability that we can then use later in the, in the debate uh, to, uh, to entice you into it. Um, so we have a, a wonderful panel. We have wonderful panelists. We are stretching uh, three continents. We're stretching the Americas, Europe, and uh, and uh, and India, uh, the Asian uh, continent. Um, and we're talking about today about uh, uh, responsible state behavior and uh, uh, and accountability. So in the debate about responsible behavior in cyberspace, we see more and more the question of uh, accountability popping up. It could be accountability of states, of private actors, of individuals. Um, and the question then becomes, okay, who has which responsibilities in cyberspace and who and how can we hold uh, actors to account if they fail to live up to those responsibilities? So this has many layers. So it has individual end users, it has corporate actors, it has liability, it has insurance, it has law, international criminal law. So many, many layers and many, many unresolved issues, I might add. Um, given the composition of our panel, we will uh, focus mostly on uh, state actors and the role of international organizations. Um, Recently, or in couple uh, in the years up to now, I think the, a lot of the conversation on accountability has focused much on the matter of uh, on the issue of attribution. Yeah? So almost like a silver bullet, we've been talking about it. However, the debate about attribution in itself is by no means closed. But if you talk about it in terms of at accountability, then attribution is basically a necessary but not a sufficient condition uh, for anything. So ideally, an attribution would address the who question. So who has done something? To some extent, it will answer the what question. So what have they actually done? But it will not answer the how question. So the question, okay, and how do we then proceed? And how do we hold someone to account? How do we hold them accountable? That is usually a separate question. Um, there is various routes that have been tried uh, uh, or not tried, uh, tested or not tested. Um, and these various routes include sort of attribution that we talked about usually accompanied with some degree of naming and shaming. So calling out that someone has done this and hoping that that will have an effect on itself. Um, you could go the route of international law, um, but only if it was a state actor uh, and only if the behavior of that state actor actually violate the principle of international law. And then only if the injured state invokes international law in its attribution. So that's a long a uh, list of things that needs to happen. Um, that is not a given. The debate about international law, uh, as, uh, as later speakers will probably say, both at the UN level, uh, but also in terms of attribution is, is far from finished. Um, if not international law, you could also turn to criminal law, for example. Uh, states can indict uh, individuals under criminal law. Uh, we've seen that, for example, in, uh, in America, where the FBA has indicted uh, a number of uh, individual 
uh, hackers, Chinese, Russian, and other hackers. And formally, you're done not pointing the finger at a state, but if you print an FBI poster, which has someone in a PLA uniform on it, then this sort of becomes a moot point. Um, but it's also a form of shaming, one would say. And then lastly, there's also retortion, there's also sanctions, there's all kinds of things that states can do uh, in reaction to something that other states have done that are uh, allowed under international law and that are in itself uh, unfriendly acts. So far, I think if we look at the debate, it's been mostly been naming and shaming. We've seen the use of criminal law, we've seen the use of sanctions. Um, perhaps we have also seen reactions that are happening uh, off the books, so retaliations. This is not always known to us. And what we have also seen, and that's a more political point, is that it has been mostly Western countries uh, doing this, attributing malicious cyber acts to a number of non-Western countries, mostly China, Russia, North Korea, Iran. So it's been a very, fairly focused thing so far. Um, and there is a trend of attribution coalitions, where increasingly a number of countries uh, together uh, uh, decides to uh, to condemn uh, certain actions in cyberspace. Um, some countries do not think that this is enough. So for a number of years, we have also been talking about, and that's also close to accountability, we've been talking about consequences. Uh, so a number of states reason that if there's no consequences for malicious behavior, then there is no real accountability. Uh, so America has been uh, championing that line mainly to beef up uh, attribution, I think, but also reversely. So some countries, um, uh, France, for example, will not participate in uh, attribution coalitions because they think it sends the wrong message. Uh, so you point the finger at someone, but you don't really apply consequences. So you're signaling perhaps weakness rather than strength. Um, so this is a very general background to, uh, to the debate. Um, and with that, we sort of turn to the main question of, uh, of, this, uh, of this discussion. So how do we establish accountability for irresponsible or malicious uh, behavior in cyberspace? And we do so mainly by looking at sort of institutional level, so the EU and the uh, Organization of American States, and at the national level, so individual states and how they see it. Um, I'm going to ask you again, uh, if you can, to look at uh, the Mentimeter in, in the time we take uh, to talk to our uh, uh, distinguished panelists, and then we can uh, revert back to that. We have a very distinguished panel for you. One of them uh, has uh, so much on her plate that she has to step out uh, at 1.30, and that would be uh, Heli Tia McClare, um, to have uh, uh, other responsibilities to tend to. Um, there are extensive bios of all the speakers on, uh, uh, on the website, so I advise you to look at those. We're going to start off uh, soon with uh, uh, Heli Tim McClare, who is Ambassador at Large for Cyber Diplomacy at the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs since uh, 2000, uh, 2018. And before that, she was Head of uh, Cyber Policy Coordination at the External Action Service of the European Union. Um, then we'll hear from Carrie Ann Barrett, who is the Cybersecurity Policy Specialist at the Cybersecurity Program at the Organization of American States. So we're moving into the Americas. Then we will hear from Ayun uh, Jayakumar, who is an Associate Fellow of the Observer Researcher Foundation uh, in uh, New Delhi, India. He works with ORF's uh, Cyber Initiative, which is part of the larger technology and media team. And a lot of people in this field will know uh, uh, ORF also from their annual sci-fi conference. Um, and then lastly, we will close for the opening statements with uh, Viktor uh, Staniecki, who is head of the cyber sector in the Security and Defense Policy Division at the External Action Service of the European Union. Um, so without further ado, because Heli has to step out uh, early, um, I'll give the floor to Heli. Thank you, Stenis, and uh, uh, thank you for uh, the organizers and EISS and Patrick to put together this important panel on accountability. Um, I am uh, going to talk about the um, uh, cyber stability framework, uh, which uh, to us, the Western governments, provides the accountability framework uh, for state behavior. It has been developed in the UN First Committee over the last 10 years, um, with the 2010, 2013 and 2015 United Nations Group of Governmental Experts on Cybersecurity Successive Reports. It has been endorsed by the UN General Assembly several times. And there are the different elements which are part of this uh, stability framework, as we call uh, this. 
First, it's international law. Uh, international law, existing international law, uh, provides sufficient guidance for state behavior and uh, all the elements and principles present in the existing international law should be applied in cyberspace. And, uh, and now we are discussing how we apply those elements in cyberspace. The second important part of the cyber stability framework is the norms of responsible state behavior. These are the voluntary non-binding peacetime norms, as we call them in the UN language, and those norms actually uh, capture major points of state behavior and um, state conduct. Uh, they address the protection of the critical infrastructure. They also address the uh, questions of um, accountability, uh, uh, attribution, as well as uh, whether the states are supposed to be using the search uh, for uh, contacts, whether, whether the states um, should be accountable for wrongful acts in cyberspace. And, uh, and there, in 2013 report, there is also a very important notion that states should not use the proxy actors in order to hide their um, activities in cyberspace. So the third part of the cyber stability framework is the confidence building measures. The confidence building measures have been usually um, discussed at the regional level and the uh, uh, region, uh, regional organization where all the European Union member states are involved is OSCE, Organization of um, Security and Cooperation in Europe, which has um, developed two sets of confidence building measures. 2013 and 2016 um, uh, confidence building measures uh, process is now being implemented in the OSCE and other regions in the world like ASEAN Regional Forum and OAS also have been embarked on the road of confidence building measures. Confidence building measures are actually quite um, uh, uh, successful in terms of uh, increasing uh, very um, uh, operational state accountability because uh, within the confidence building process, the states are agreeing on points of contacts on technical level, on political level, and uh, this provides the first layer of, uh, of conflict uh, prevention framework for, for the governments. Uh, also, very important uh, part of the accountability uh, is the capacity building. And the capacity building is something that the UN um, uh, successive GG reports have been stressing um, many uh, in, in, in all these years. Um, the capacity building is not just the capacity building in terms of uh, increasing cyber resilience and protecting critical infrastructure, but it's also increasing the government's and state's capacity in order to um, apply international law in order to uh, um, uh, learn or, uh, or train in terms of uh, uh, cyber exercises, uh, in order to uh, implement the norms of responsible state behavior and all this um, more uh, political military type of um, activities um, in our uh, uh, cyber stability framework. Uh, of course, the current virus uh, crisis uh, um, has created a new reality where we see that the virtual modes of communication and cyber stability and cyber security have become even more important than before. And uh, certainly we have seen uh, many um, international virtual events that have been addressing this. And I think um, one of the um, uh, ongoing processes currently in the UN First Committee, the open-ended working group, we have been holding virtually um, the last intersessional meetings of this group. So it uh, also sh shows that um, the UN business is going online. Uh, if there, uh, there are listeners who are wondering uh, um, what do we governments expect uh, from the both UN processes in the First Committee now? Um, well, we have the group of governmental experts and open-ended working group going on. And um, many outsiders who have not been in those uh, meeting rooms in New York would ask what's the difference between those two groups. Uh, may I just explain a bit the differences? So the UNGG is a small uh, club of the countries which has quite expertise um, or expert level discussions that require um, higher level of uh, understanding of the issues of international law, uh, uh, state responsibility, 
what kind of uh, actions are allowed and not allowed under the international law for governments in cyberspace. And, um, and so these discussions are uh, now going on in the GG. In the open-ended working group, we have based the discussions on the already existing basis that the first committee um, uh, agreements uh, uh, and the General Assembly uh, uh, resolutions have provided for us. And these are the 2010, 2013 and 2015 GG reports. So uh, in the open-ended working group, we are basically discussing how to implement the already agreed principles and norms. And, uh, and all, of course, in the open-ended working group, uh, there is also uh, a possibility to involve the larger multi-stakeholder community in these discussions because uh, this was in their mandate. Uh, and uh, uh, if, if I may maybe very simplistically put it, the open-ended working group is a very useful venue to socialize the existing normative framework, which, which we already have developed. Whereas uh, the GG would be a useful format to create an additional layer uh, of implementation of uh, already existing norms. So um, I would say in terms of uh, normative framework, we, we certainly have uh, this accountability uh, there. The question is how we implement it. And the implementation of the existing framework is something that I think we are all discussing currently uh, in, in the UN and also in the regional organizations and with um, the uh, ongoing um, international crisis, of course, the capacity building will be the key in implementing the normative framework. Um, I uh, could go into the specifics of uh, how the uh, principles of international law would provide for accountability, but maybe I will skip my very long speech that I had prepared on international law because we have experienced <laughs> the technical issues. So um, maybe I just um, make a notion that um, uh, we think international law as it is right now is a sufficient basis for the uh, state behavior. Uh, it's um, not just um, about um, conduct in cyberspace in terms of uh, what the states are supposed to be doing uh, uh, during the armed conflict or below the armed conflict, but it's also about um, uh, the international law that applies for individuals. So states also have to uh, respect um, uh, human rights and fundamental freedoms and freedom of expression online. Uh, so uh, there is uh, the ongoing argument some, uh, in some international discussions that uh, if we uh, accept that international humanitarian law uh, applies in cyberspace, this pushes us towards the militarization of cyberspace. And uh, at least the Estonian position is that um, we think that um, international law is not an enabler of the conflict, but it is the protector of civilians and the protector of uh, um, uh, individuals and uh, civilian objects during the war. So we cannot really say that international law is guilty of the militarization of cyberspace. So uh, international uh, humanitarian law is protective in its essence. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, um, I think uh, all the efforts that our governments are currently doing in terms of um, creating more awareness of international law applying in cyberspace and also articulating how this applies in cyberspace will be uh, essential in terms of uh, creating more accountability. And you talked about attribution tennis. Attribution mm -hmm. is just part of the state responsibility as an important part of existing international law below the threshold of armed conflict. So I would anchor all these discussions in the existing international law and take it from there. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, uh, Heli, because you have to step out uh, soon, so maybe maybe one question. So you talked about how, how the UN processes have basically sort of provided a stability framework, as you call it, uh, so uh, international law, norms, CBMs, um, um, and there's a lot of faith in, in, in this. Uh, you say basically international law is sufficient uh, to, uh, to regulate state behavior in cyberspace. Um, at the same time, um, um, there's a lot of things going on where most states say they shouldn't be going on. And how has this stability framework uh, helped holding states accountable for this? So, so where can you point to, uh, uh, to states sort of holding other states to account using this framework you, you talk about? 
Uh, this is an important question uh, that uh, uh, we all are pondering on. Uh, and of course, there is this um, initiative to uh, 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 put together by the like-minded nations and the United uh, States um, on cyber stability and cyber deterrence. So this is uh, uh, the first step towards um, broader uh, uh, accountability. Uh, we have done the collective attribution um, statements uh, with several countries in the European Union and also brought a like-minded um, group of the countries. This is the first step of naming and shaming. Uh, I think quite, uh, of course, in the EU context, quite importantly right now, we have um, uh, the cyber sanctions uh, uh, discussions going on still in the EU. Uh, this is uh, one of the examples how the accountability will be imposed eventually. And, and there are many other parts of, um, of the uh, implementation of the cyber stability framework that would make uh, uh, state activities more accountable, uh, of course, in, within the frames of international law. Uh, and the important part is, is again the capacity building, because uh, I think one of the issues what we are facing now in global uh, cyber discussions is this very uneven level of preparedness and technical capability between the government states, different states, and then we have to address that urgently. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I know you have to step out soon. Thank you very much uh, for your you. uh, for your contribution. Um, stay uh, as long as you can uh, to hear the others speak, yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. we'll meet uh, again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we will now move from Estonia and the European Union uh, towards the Americas, and, um, and I'll ask uh, Carrie Ann Barrett uh, to take the floor. Carrie Ann. Uh, thanks, Dennis. Um, I think we wanted to just kick off with a key message that. And it, it ties into what Heli just mentioned about capacity building. Um, one of the things that we wanted to highlight is that to hold the state accountable as a goal, we believe is extremely difficult if there's an absence of capacity to investigate, if there is no existence of an environment that actually fosters information exchange and there's no establishment of trust. Um, one of the things the OAS has um, promoted is that countries must be prepared to be able to adapt quickly and probably and I think recognizing that the digital world is pretty dynamic they must be able to make decisions um, as constantly as the landscape is changing and our member states have to manage these risks understanding the impact and the likelihood that cyber threats have on their citizens their organizations and their national critical infrastructure um, to improve cybersecurity in the region, for us, it requires a very comprehensive and sustainable cybersecurity policy, supported not only by our regional perspective, but also by the country's political agenda and the allocation of financial resources to have qualified human resources to carry out these mandates. Um, in this context, where many of our countries in the Americas are experiencing significant levels of investments um, in their essential sectors, including banking, finance, to ensure that they can digitize and offer better services to their member states. We think that a cyber attack can be far reaching and catastrophic. Um, further, since the advent of COVID-19, we realized that there's been an increase in the number of attacks because of the number of online users that are now um, onboarded. We didn't see so many persons going online until COVID. And now that they are online, we realized that the Third vectors have increased and our member states have to start thinking about it that way. Um, generally, the OES created the cybersecurity program within the SICTA Secretariat as a means to respond to our member states' needs to build their capacity in cybersecurity. Um, as one of the first dedicated cybersecurity capacity programs in the world, I believe, the OES has undertaken several activities that have increased the knowledge and trained over 20,000 persons trying to ensure that they have the requisite skills and tools. But what we want to highlight is that capacity building is not a one-stop shop. It's something that has to be reiterative and has to be assessed on a continuous basis. Um, in this regard, we try to stress that member states can't underestimate the benefit they can gain from having strategic relationship with industrial leaders, because in doing that, they're able to have a better sense of what their threat landscape looks like because the private sector does manage and run a lot of their critical infrastructure 
and the private sector also has a lot of the resources needed to actually investigate and information sharing is critical in that sense as well. Um, to continue on one of the points um, Ellie raised on the UN discussions, our member states have recognized the importance of this and have participated actively. Um, Brazil, one of our members is actually the chair of one of the working groups. And one of the things that we have stressed is we support their continued participation in these discussions. So as a part of our capacity building, we either offer scholarships to ensure that we have the right representation if our member states desire to attend, because our member states are sovereign nations. So in terms of having an individual opinion, some of them have even posted on the UN um, open-ended working group and on the UN GTG website, their firm position on it. They have also expressed how they have implemented the norms that have been agreed already in the 2015 report. And that's open and accessible to anyone um, listening if they want to access that on the UN website. Um, further, our member states also recognize the importance of information sharing and confidence building measures. As such, we have established a working group on cooperation and confidence building measures in cyberspace. We've already agreed to six CBMs, which have subsequently been adopted by the OAS General Assembly. They have been added to our consolidated list of confidence building measures in security generally which we have a very long list um, that's updated every year. Um, these CBMs recognize the need for points of contacts. And we believe that this particular um, measure actually supports the norms that were agreed in the UN, where you have to be able to contact the right person if there's an incident. It's not a matter that you think that country A has attacked you and you just automatically start to investigate and conclude that we believe that contacting the right persons, knowing who to speak to in the different countries is important. Our member states have also encouraged the incorporation of cybersecurity and cyberspace issues in basic training courses for diplomats and officials at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and other government agencies, and also the need to train up foreign affairs officers on the issues to allow them to better communicate policy positions. Um, this is all embedded in our measures that have been agreed already. In our measures, we've also spoken about how to implement it, which um, Heli was speaking about implementing the cyber stability framework. We have measures in terms of how do we practically implement this. The cybersecurity program has been running several courses. And since COVID, we've moved these courses online like automatically to ensure that our member states access to these courses have not stopped. So we have successfully implemented with the government of the Netherlands, a course on the Hague process and cyber operations and international law. We have also with the support of the government of Canada implemented a cyber diplomacy course with the support of Diplo Foundation, just to ensure that our member states are able to articulate policy issues in cyberspace and speak the right language. We wanted to kind of close by just saying that we recognize the role that regional blocks play in this discussion or facilitation of creating a space for dialogue, we think it's critical, or facilitation of facilitating um, information exchange through our CSIRTS Americas platform, which has many of our member states um, incident response teams participating where they can have an open discussion with each other, we think is critical, and also facilitating and producing capacity building opportunities, we think is critical to contribute into this discussion. Um, in closing, just to pull everything together, we wanted to emphasize that a meaningful discussion on attribution or even accountability can't be done without the recognition that capacity is important. The catastrophic impact that wrongful attribution can happen in our state, um, it, it, it's, it, we can't explain to you because of how small the states are. So for example, some of the sanctions that Heli even spoke about, if attribution is placed wrongly, our member states could suffer a lot. So we believe that them building the capacity to first think about the issues and being able to identify what's happening to them is critical. As such, we have focused on building capacity, developing confidence building measures, recognizing that the need to build trust and information sharing is gold, especially in critical times. So I think that's where we probably stop our general comments and hand it back to you. 
Thank you very much, Carrie, and that is uh, a very uh, good and succinct uh, contribution to the debate. Um, really important point uh, about capacity. I like the way you framed it. There's no holding anyone to account if there is no capacity. And then also your point at the very end to say, okay, the risks of wrong attribution is also uh, very valid. Um, two other interesting things I want to sort of flag up from, from your uh, presentation is one, sort of COVID-19 and the fact that uh, uh, the whole world moved online sort of also increased the threat surface so the attack surface for all kinds of actors, which sort of also changes uh, the world around us a little, which is interesting. And then one comment perhaps, and we may pick up on that later about uh, confidence building measures. As I understand it, confidence building measures are usually uh, they're most effective um, for uh, uh, for problems of unintended escalation. Uh, so, so when people misread the signs, etc., and then you escalate into something, you have confidence building measures in place, like points of contact, to make sure you have uh, a, a, an avenue to sort of mitigate that. But that sort of still leaves uh, unanswered the question: uh, What do you do with malicious actors who are very determined to do what they want to do, and then confidence measures, uh, confidence building measures, will not help for that probably. So we need a different solution for that kind of problem. Also, Patrick has reminded me that um, uh, since my introduction uh, has uh, failed to air, um, uh, please, everybody who is on the live stream, um, there's a link to a Menti uh, uh, website where we would like to ask you a few questions, three questions. Um, if you would be kind enough to uh, uh, sort of fill those questions in for us, um, then we may be able to use them for the uh, latter part of the debate. Um, I will now go to Ayun. Uh, and for, uh, uh, for his perspective on, uh, on accountability. Ayun, you have the floor. Okay, uh, thank you, Dennis, for the introduction. And I'm grateful to the EU Cyber Direct and the other organizers for inviting me for this important discussion. And I just wanted to say that in my remarks, I'll be providing a brief overview of uh, the Indian perspective on the accountability discourse. And I will also be talking about a few steps that I think we can take to close the accountability gap. <clears throat> so, uh, India, um, we have seen, we have been a target of, of many cyber attacks over the years, both from within the country and outside, from state actors and non-state actors. Just last year, for instance, we saw two critical malware attacks, one on a nuclear power plant and another on the Indian Space Research Organization during its critical moon mission. So um, both attacks have informally been linked to the Lazarus Group, but India has not made any public attributions to this uh, effect. In fact, um, India has still to make uh, a public attribution for any cyber attack at all, which goes to show that attribution is still a key bottleneck when it comes to accountability in cyberspace. Um, uh, gathering enough evidence to make an attribution in the first place and uh, holding responsible parties meaningfully accountable after making an attribution are other challenges. Um, now, uh, unfortunately, India's views on overcoming these challenges are a little unclear, and uh, we have not yet taken a significant stance on the norms of responsible behavior in cyberspace. We have broadly said during the OEWG uh, sessions that uh, we need uh, more of a conversation on understanding how international law applies to the cyberspace and how we need to have more bilateral and multilateral engagement to uh, uh, sort of uh, discuss how IL actually applies and that the UN has a core role to play in, in enabling this discourse. But I think there is still room for a much more nuanced stance from the part of India and, and uh, I think we need to be looking into taking uh, and an enunciated stand on, on what we think about uh, closing the accountability gap. And I think there's already a healthy discourse in the, in the, in the domain to sort of build this understanding of India from. Uh, for instance, I think it will be useful to have standardized protocols on international level to gather and analyze evidence of cyber attacks, as this will help alleviate concerns about the integrity of evidence. Uh, we should also look into shortening the bureaucratic delays involved in making attribution decisions and making them public. This could be done, for instance, by uh, establishing well-defined processes uh, at the national level and also by uh, improving information sharing between countries. Uh, the act of actually attributing cyber attack is always a political one at the end of the day. And what's needed here is to be able to convince others that attribution is in fact accurate and backed up by evidence. Um, once an attribution is made, uh, the next step would be to ensure that the responsible parties face the consequences for their actions. And this is perhaps the most challenging part of the process, especially when the cyber attack in question has been orchestrated by state actors. Uh, to formulate effective responses, I think uh, what we need to do is uh, to have more deliberations, like I said earlier, on how international law applies to the cyberspace. And uh, perhaps consider the idea of a global governance framework to enforce accountability. 
So these are just a few of the steps that I think uh, we can take to improve uh, the accountability gap and sort of uh, close the gap in this regard. Um, uh, I also wanted to briefly mention uh, some initiatives that India has taken from a national perspective to uh, sort of close the accountability gap. And uh, this is this is not directly related to the gap, but it's it's more from an indirect perspective. I think it's still relevant. So. Um, uh, so, uh, so we already have, for instance, uh, a number of sectoral regulations that require Indian data to be stored locally within the country, and uh, we also have an upcoming Data Protection Act, which which is also going to introduce some more comprehensive rules in this regard. And and I think uh, this is relevant because this is uh, an attempt by India to establish some sort of a sovereign control over its data, and. Um, the Data Protection Act, in fact, defines a category of critical personal data, which which can never leave India under any circumstances. So, um, a key motivation, I think, for mandating data localization uh, processes like this is is that it will allow Indian authorities to access information held by digital service providers more readily, and which in turn will make it easier to investigate cyber attacks and hold the responsible parties accountable under Indian law. Now, there are a few diverging views on the effectiveness of this measure, and we still need to see to what extent these norms will actually come into force. But I think this is still worth mentioning as it's broadly linked to the accountability debate. Um, so I think I will sort of uh, close my initial remarks at this point, and I'll be happy to jump in at a later point. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ayun. Um, interesting to hear uh, 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 an, an Indian perspective. Um, interesting also to hear that um, Ed, that you indicate there's a lot of attacks and fairly serious attacks going on uh, um, uh, in India um, that do not get much airplay, that do not get outed in terms of attribution, and that you would sort of like to outline uh, steps to, to, to get better at that. One of the things you mentioned, um, which is interesting, is that you need more information exchange between states. Uh, earlier, Carrie Ann said, okay, we need more information exchange between states and private parties. I'm guessing that's included in this as well. Um, um, but that's still all building towards the step of attribution, basically. Uh, and, and then still there is the whole long road to go uh, to uh, to actual uh, either imposing consequences or have something out there uh, uh, that's, that may actually deter or discourage actors from uh, from doing this, so actually holding them to account. Um, so thank you very much uh, for that, uh, that contribution. Um, now we're going to um, uh, turn to uh, Victor, who will solve everything for us, and uh, <laughs> who will um, uh, perhaps um, um, tell us something from, uh, from the perspective of, of the European Union, the External Action Service, and also the toolbox and the sanctions regime that has been uh, uh, developed there. So how does that fit into uh, this, this larger picture that we're talking about here? Uh, Victor, the floor is yours. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dennis, and uh, thank uh, to uh, organizers as well for, first of all, pulling that uh, the uh, conference together, closing the gap, and also uh, for uh, uh, for um, gathering such a such a illustrious and great uh, panel. So, without further ado, I think that a uh, lot of uh, things has been uh, have been said, and I very much subscribe uh, uh, to uh, what uh, Heli and uh, Carrie Ann and. Uh, uh, Others said uh, about you know the uh, the uh, uh, importance of uh, of the ongoing uh, discussions uh, on the uh, uh, in the UN, uh, namely the group of governmental experts and open-ended working group uh, that uh, that sort of dwells into uh, applicability of international law, uh, uh, promotion of norms of responsible state behavior, as well as as uh, confidence building measures. These elements are absolutely uh, crucial because they are kind of a bedrock of uh, of any discussion uh, on uh, on accountability uh, for the future. I mean, it's uh, it's very uh, simple to say that we uh, support uh, both of the strands of discussion as the European Union and our member states, and uh, and uh, uh, we strongly believe that uh, states should cooperate to strengthen the strategic framework for conflict prevention and cyber stability. Uh, in uh, in terms of uh, in terms of why it is important is also that uh, these efforts uh, uh, help to enhance transparency, predictability, and uh, help to reduce the risk of conflict, and also contribute to the settlement of international uh, disputes in cyberspace by peaceful means. In terms of uh, EU behavior, I mean, uh, and coming to your uh, point about the uh, EU cyber diplomacy toolbox. 
we as the European Union and our leadership uh, has on various occasions signaled uh, our concerns on and, and our willingness to pursue actions aimed at mitigating malicious activities. And uh, we sh were very keen as well to enhance cooperation with international partners on these issues. To name uh, very few examples, it's in, um, on the 30th of April this year, uh, um, the um, High Representative and Vice President issued a declaration on behalf of uh, EU uh, 27 on malicious cyber activities exploiting the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, previously, in April 2019, there has been uh, another declaration uh, stressing the need to respect the rules-based order in cyberspace urging the actors to stop undertaking malicious cyber activities, including uh, uh, the theft of intellectual property. Uh, we have been, as you mentioned as well, uh, since uh, 2019 and, and previously working on uh, 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 putting in place a horizontal EU cyber sanctions regime. Uh, this regime can be used in response to cyber attacks or attempted cyber attacks that threaten the European Union, uh, our member states, as well as third states or international organizations. This um, uh, uh, horizontal uh, sanctions regime has been prolonged in May this year until 18th of May, 2021. All these uh, public efforts uh, uh, are part of the uh, frame 2017 framework for a joint EU diplomatic response to malicious cyber activities, so-called cyber diplomacy toolbox. It is important to say that uh, this, the toolbox is the part of EU wider cyber diplomacy efforts that contribute uh, in our belief to conflict prevention, mitigation of cyber threats and greater stability in international relations. We hope that uh, the cyber diplomacy toolbox, uh, uh, or we expect that it will encourage cooperation, facilitate mitigation of immediate and also long-term uh, threats and influence the behavior of potential aggressors in the long term. In our belief, the clearly signaling the likely consequences uh, of a joint diplomatic response uh, aim at influencing and discouraging uh, the behavior of potential aggressors uh, in cyberspace. The toolbox uh, um, allows responding through a tailored and uh, strategic approach, uh, which could include multiple uh, measures implemented over time. It could also uh, be used uh, uh, for an immediate response uh, or uh, in order to support or complement lawful responses by member states uh, that are made in accordance with international law. Responses that are not available within the EU common foreign and security policy. Uh, in that, uh, to this end, uh, we as the European Union and our member states are continuously monitoring and addressing the challenges that cyberspace uh, poses. Uh, such efforts have been made public, but uh, others have not been made public and uh, will remain uh, private. Um, coming back to, to the issue of attribution that you uh, mentioned, that uh, some responses uh, may also benefit from attribution. However, alternatives could be considered to be more effective with regard to a particular case or a particular perpetrator or in particular time. Also, not all diplomatic measures, uh, which are part of the toolbox, require attribution. For example, diplomatic measures may be involved in preventing or resolving cyber incident, expressing concern and signaling likely consequences. Another example is sanctions, um, as listing, as, as we very often hear, is often confused with attribution to a state. The fact that an individual or entity is listed, or uh, currently there are no listings under the uh, restrictive measures, but uh, if, if uh, such uh, things happen, uh, the, the fact does not amount to attribution to a state. The cyber, cyber sanctions regime addresses persons and entities involved in cyber attacks or attempted cyber attacks with a significant effect and uh, which constitute an external threat to the union or its member states regardless of their nationality or location. Um, as the other measures, uh, which are part of the toolbox, the cyber sanctions regime signal uh, EU's determination to respond and deter cyber attacks and could be, but it's not necessarily accompanied, uh, but are not necessarily accompanied by uh, attribution to a state. A response addressing a state as the perpetrator, however, requires the ability to determine with a sufficient degree of certainty who is responsible. So it answers your question, who, why, and how. 
such ability, which can be coordinated at EU level, could signal capabilities, send a clear message that cyberspace is not a rule, uh, rules uh, 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 without rules, and could influence the perpetrator to refrain from any further action. If, of course, the perpetrator is receptive to such reputational harm, uh, and also this could pave the way for further responses. It also could work as the uh, um, alert to businesses and the general public to a threat, as well as contribute to showing solidarity with those affected. Furthermore, the ability to identify the responsible actor and to respond uh, in a controlled and flexible manner could contribute to advance, uh, advancing cyber stability and preventing conflicts in cyberspace. Uh, let me uh, uh, as well uh, um, go into, I think that uh, what has been very rightly stressed, uh, the importance of capacity building, uh, which I also believe that is absolutely a crucial element, uh, element uh, uh, in, uh, in training and capacity building in, in context of, uh, uh, of building uh, and promoting responsible state behavior. I think that there is, uh, in, in that regard, there is a lot of difference. Some states have been uh, in cyber diplomacy business for a, a long time. Others um, have only recently started to shape their engagement on international cyber issues, as well as building their national cyber policies. So um, um, strengthening cyber resilience, developing uh, cyber, domestic cyber crime laws, training security, law enforcement, and judicial personnel as well as diplomats uh, are part, uh, part of, uh, of a very important uh, work. Therefore, it is, uh, we believe, and I'll be finishing uh, shortly in order to leave time uh, for further questions. We believe that it's of utmost importance that the international community at large further invests in capacity building to boost national competences and capabilities, which are essential to international cooperation. Strengthening the knowledge and capacities and increasing global resilience, in our view, contributes to maintaining peace and stability in cyberspace. And of course, you know, the international cooperation is absolutely crucial uh, in that regard. So let me uh, finish but, uh, by uh, also highlighting that the development of EU cyber diplomacy toolbox uh, offered uh, EU and our member states not only a framework to exchange on threats or a mechanism to make decisions to jointly deter and respond but also a platform to exchange on best practices, lessons learned, and opportunity to strengthen national capabilities and mechanism to cooperate on responses together with our partners. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Victor. Um, a, a lot to, uh, to think about. Um, also in terms of um, how close we are to actual accountability with all the efforts you sort of describe, um, uh, which is which is still sort of uh, the, the the question underlying all this. Eh? So we talk in terms of frameworks, we talk in terms of capacity building, we talk in all kinds of terms, and they're all massively important. I do not deny that. But the question is still, so where do we end up in terms of holding actors accountable? Do we have the things uh, in hand to actually do that? And uh, many people signaling uh, uh, capabilities, for example, as an important aspect, which it of course is. Um, what was interesting also uh, is that you said, okay, at Attribution is not always the way, yeah? so diplomacy has a much wider toolbox than just uh, going public, and obviously that is the case. Um, also, what is interesting, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to tease you a little, and I'm not sure you're, you're, you're going to be able to answer this being a diplomat, but um, uh, you say, okay, yeah, so, the, so the sanctions regime does not mean an attribution to a state. Um, uh, however, now you find yourself in, in the situation where the German government has pushed an issue forward, the Bundestag hack uh, from 2015, to be considered for this, where the German government has already pointed in the direction of, uh, of, of, of the Russian government. So, so this, is, this is sort of the shadow spiel we have uh, uh, also around these things. Uh, so, so formally, no, eh, according to, to the guidelines uh, of the sanctions regime, no, it is not an attribution. But obviously, uh, if you take into account the wider information position, it becomes a very different story, much like the PLA uh, officer on the FBI poster. So, so this is also, uh, but that, that's also diplomats, right? It's, it's shadow games. But could you, could you uh, perhaps say anything about, 
uh, because the German uh, Bundestag hack is the first case that will land on the desk of the European Union to be considered for, for this cyber sanctions regime. Could you say something about that or is that not uh, uh, possible? Well, I, I will refrain um, um, from commenting about the details because this is uh, this is unfortunately not uh, not possible, and also a lot. You know, uh, uh, I think that uh, it would be way easier for a German representative to talk about uh, to uh, to talk about the German case than uh, than uh, from me. But I, I will um, rather, you know, if you allow me, then is to go into uh, into the issue that you mentioned about, you know. Uh, uh, assumption that many uh, people make with, uh, you know, with potential uh, listings in the future that will uh, amount to attribution. And I think that indeed there is a what we've noticed uh, through, you know, having uh, having extensive actually uh, uh, discussions about, you know, coordinated attribution at the EU level, and uh, and also when uh, when the sanctions regime have been uh, putting in place, there is a lot of confusion uh, about, you know, about, you know, or, or uh, uh, let me put it that way. Uh, different difference in understanding what attribution stands for, and I think that you know if you look from the international law perspective, which I'm not the lawyer, so you you uh, you can uh, probably uh, develop way more about that. It's a very uh, very uh, uh, it's also very defined uh, defined uh, term within the international law. You know, it's uh, it's it's actually there is a very clear process on how how the accountability state accountability is uh, established and and what uh, you know what it entails. Uh, two states. Let me also um, highlight that you know um, uh, attribution is and will remain uh, uh, um, a prerogative of state. So EU as such uh, is not uh, attributing, will not be able to attribute. Of course, as I said, we have established uh, ways of how we, uh, uh, you know, how our member states can can use the uh, platform such as cyber diplomacy toolbox to discuss and eventually come into the conclusion of uh, of coordinating uh, attribution so uh, having a 27 uh, attributions uh, 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 happening at the same time uh, but uh, but it's as as i said you know uh, it's sanctions regime and listing on the sanctions regime is a, is a completely uh, different uh, different uh, and and parallel track and uh, uh, let me just maybe pass last mes message about attribution, uh, very little. And I think that this is absolutely key. That's my very personal strong belief that actually, uh, uh, you know, having putting that for every state, be it a member state of the European Union or, or any other state, actually to put it to put a system in place that allows, you know, uh, uh, not ad hoc, but the systemic uh, uh, identification, understanding, uh, uh, and and process for attribution is very important to, uh, in general, have a better understanding and better, clearer way how to uh, how to react to malicious cyber activities uh, in the future. Thank you very much. Spoken like a true diplomat. Um, uh, thanks. That's that's clear. Um, uh, also, I'm, I'm not an international lawyer. I just play one on TV every now and then. Um, perhaps uh, now would be a good moment. We have given uh, we've been given leeway to continue until a quarter past two, if that is all right for the panel. I'm looking if everybody is OK with that, then, then then we should take that time, I think. Um, um, I would like to ask the panel if, if they want to have a sh if they perhaps have short comment on one of the other speakers or a question, um, I will give room for that. Um, if not, I will go over to uh, to Patrick to ask him um, uh, to put up the, uh, the results um, uh, of the oh, there, there we go. You never have to ask. OK. Okay, so it looks like we are. Oh, uh, Carrie Ann raised her hand, so we're coming to Carrie Ann in a bit. Um, but it looks like we are mainly. Okay, we have a small N, said the researcher, um, but mostly academics and researchers um, uh, who are here, private sector and a few governments. Um, this is the people who have actually uh, 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 answered the question. Um, perhaps the next one, uh, Patrick. Can I do that myself? No, yeah, here we go. The ongoing strongly agree. Okay, so this is this is an interesting one, I think, for the panel to to reflect on. So um because um, if you look at what it is, then basically say, okay, the, the ongoing processes have brought more accountability in cyberspace. People tend to agree with that. Um, however, they almost 
in equal measure agree with the fact that we need a binding international treaty, which is going way beyond uh, what the current processes are doing at the moment. So that's interesting to note. And the third one is we need to find a completely new way to think about accountability. Um, um, so um, it looks like we have uh, our work uh, cut out for us. Um, the th third slide, perhaps. So let me see. So what do we need? Um, which of the following approaches is the most promising for assuring accountability in cyberspace? Um, the UN. Okay, so so we have people flocking towards the UN, so still expressing uh, some faith in, in, in the current processes, if I may say so, but also quite a lot of people talking about many lateral coalitions of like-minded countries. So that is interesting. So So we have, if we take the last two slides together, we have people saying, okay, we need to think about new ways uh, to move forward. Um, and a lot of the people uh, uh, seem to go in the direction, okay, we need to think about smaller coalitions uh, that will uh, uh, be able to uh, uh, help us forward uh, outside of the big, uh, larger institutional context. Um, that is very interesting. Um, Carrie Ann asked for the floor, which I'm uh, uh, happy uh, to give her. Um, and that will also settle her with the task maybe to have a first reflection on, on what, uh, uh, what this uh, uh, poll sort of gives us. Carry on. Well, I was more reacting to um, a comment that Victor made about the fact that at the national level, um, countries need to start thinking about their policies and laws. And I wanted to highlight that we also support that at the regional level. Um, we have been supporting our member states to develop national cybersecurity policies. We have 12 member states already with them, and we have almost six in development. And what we recognize is having that coordinated approach, which even Victor alluded to, allows your, our member states to be able to think through their processes at a national level. And that includes the development of legislation on cybercrime. Um, it can't be a crime unless you have a law specifically saying that it's a crime. So being able to even hold individuals or companies accountable, the first step is having the legislation in place. And as we reiterated before, the next step would be building the capacity to use those legislation because the cross-border nature of cyber crimes, you need to be able to investigate, share evidence, share information. So I think it's just was just to support Victor that even in the Americas, it's a thing that we have been working on and focused on and supporting our member states to be able to complete this process. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps uh, to, to take uh, the point of the slide and maybe ask uh, Ayun. So uh, if you look at the, the, the Indian context, uh, so the context you're in, uh, also one thing we haven't really addressed, um, which is uh, one of the elephants in the room is geopolitics, right? So it matters in which region you live, it matters who your neighbors are, it matters uh, what kind of relationships uh, your country holds internationally, whether you're a, 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 a regional superpower or not. So, so all these things factor into this as well. But if you take sort of the, the finding from, from this uh, very small poll and say, okay, we need to perhaps look for different avenues uh, to move forward. And perhaps we need to move to smaller groups of state uh, uh, to uh, uh, to take a step. So what what could that, for example, mean for India, Ayun? So what kind of possibilities do you see for steps that are sort of outside of the, the normal channels we have now, like the UN, etc.? So do you see possibilities for anything like that? Yeah, I do. I do see uh, there's a possibility for, for smaller regional collaborations, for instance, to talk about cyber norms that should govern accountability frameworks. Because uh, when you look at Western countries and, and the more uh, countries towards the global south, I think we have different priorities in terms of, of what we want out of this like international coalition and how we want to drive this discussion forward. So I think it will be useful to have smaller regional groups and, and focus groups that talk about uh, how the region itself wants to take these conversations forward and sort of better reflect their own interests in terms of uh, like uh, how we should bridge the accountability gap. And I think it's also very interesting to see that that uh, that a comprehensive new treaty is is something that is highlighted as a, as a very important uh, part of of taking this uh, accountability framework forward. And I think that's that's actually very correct also. But uh, again, like here, it's 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 also good from an ideal perspective to say that that this like a global treaty that that governs that lays down some standardized set of norms and rules and how everybody should behave. That's that's the way forward. But I think arriving at this is also like a little difficult because, because again, like I said, we will all have different priorities. And I think like, this is the fact that we will run into 
road blocks is evident from the fact that India has still, for instance, not signed on to the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, which also addresses like a, a major uh, problem area for India, which is that it hasn't been able to get information from cross-border governments in terms of investigating cyber crimes. So this just goes to show that it's it's actually quite difficult to arrive at an international consensus on something like this. But we should definitely be pushing for something along those lines. Just just a quick follow up on that. So um, so on the on the position of a global encompassing treaty, does does uh, India have a formal position on that? So most European states are are against. They have a formal position on that. But um, does does India have a formal position? Uh, India does not actually have a formal position on this yet, because like I said, India has not actually taken a public stance on how the norm shaping of the cyber space should actually function. So. I think there will be more engagement on this from India moving forward because we are coming up with a comprehensive new national cybersecurity strategy in 2020, which is supposed to come out this year. So I think this, this might provide more details on how India expects this conversation to go forward. But as of now, the details are a little slight. Okay. Interesting. Um, uh, Victor, perhaps you would like to comment uh, as well. Um, um, yep. So, so uh, from, from the mini poll, because it is a mini poll, um, um, you see that a lot of people, all those pesky academics, um, they sort of <laughs> they sort of move away from well, not fully move away, but but they also see possibilities in in sort of new uh, 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 new constellations of actors, perhaps uh, new kinds of uh, approaches. Uh, we haven't asked them what it is because we can't. But um, you, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I think yeah, I think that uh, it is uh, indeed uh, interesting uh, interesting to uh, to get uh, that feedback, which uh, which you know I can uh, I can uh, partly understand why uh, why sort of uh, you know it's it's quite uh, uh, quite uh, uh, or sounds good to have uh, to have to start from the blank sheet and and uh, and rewrite uh, all the rules. But I think that there are you know it's uh, it's um, something that uh, in my view it's uh, extremely difficult and dangerous uh, uh, if I may say also you know from the uh, coming back to the question of accountability because I think that you know the uh, the likelihood and you mentioned also geopolitics and I think that this is an extremely uh, important point uh, to make that in the current geopolitical context that we are in in the world and the degree of uh, polarization between uh, different actors or 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 lack of you know or or uh, lack of uh, high degree of cooperation international cooperation i think that the uh, likelihood that there will be a, a you know a, a common agreement on a set of uh, new norms or new laws found within the united nations uh, member states in a, a foreseeable future uh, is uh, is um, where i say like impossible virtually impossible and I think that, to my mind, it opens up a, a, a you know a, a great danger zone that uh, some actors might deduce that therefore there are no rules, um, uh, so we can do everything what we can, and nobody can hold us accountable to uh, anything. And I that, and I think that this uh, potentially could uh, you know be a very dangerous situation to find itself. Uh, and I think also I found interesting from the poll this uh, this um, sort of split that on one hand people still believe. Uh, and I rightly so, we still very strongly believe in the multilateral system, but at the same time are very much in favor of uh, moving ahead with uh, sort of small coalitions. And I think that, you know, there is a lot of um, possibilities for small coalitions indeed uh, to work. I think that, you know, the work, uh, the I, I would quote the confidence building measures a very good example where, where the regional uh, groupings can uh, can uh, sort of uh, advance work and maybe uh, do some uh, some uh, inject some uh, some specific flavors to it. But I think that you know coming together and discussing and agreeing uh, and discussing things on a, on a uh, global scale uh, in the multilateral forum still has a has an extremely big advantage of not allowing uh, different uh, uh, and maybe sometimes non compatible regimes to uh, to uh, pop up. And you know, and then it will be very difficult to ex exactly navigate. You know, what is what is a universal norm? And I think that we still have a very good basis uh, um, uh, for with the UN GGG uh, work that has been done of a universal uh, uh, um, uh, agreed uh, norms of responsible state behavior that we can uh, we can uh, uh, promote uh, further. All right. Thank you very much. Um, you sort of carved open uh, a really interesting and important and extremely difficult question when you talked about sort of the danger zone, sort of 
Uh, are we not creating? Uh, are we are we not at risk of creating a zone in which state actors feel free to behave in a certain way that we're not covering with the various frameworks we're talking about? Uh, so some people, uh, so Lucas Keller calls it uh, the, the, the situation of unpeace. Uh, Mike Schmidt calls it the gray zone of international law. So there is still that that element of that a lot of the activities that we would like state actors to be held accountable for are sort of below a certain threshold and we're having trouble sort of getting uh, uh, to grips uh, with it. Um, do we need, is that perhaps uh, um, uh, an area where we need very different kind of thinking because this is not something we're gonna easily catch with, uh, with international law. We're gonna need to think of something else uh, for this. Um, would anyone like to comment on that? It is a large and chunky question, so I'm okay with leaving it leaving it there. So, uh, so all the academics can uh, can uh, go through it. I have one question uh, coming in uh, through the uh, uh, through the chats, and this is a question from uh, from Brian Stokes from the Georgia Institute of uh, Technology. It's a very broad question, um, so it's maybe a question for all of us. But I think a number of you have already addressed it a little bit. Say, so, okay. Education will be essential to strengthen the knowledge and enforcement of cyber norms. So how do we create this educational framework that spans the globe? Uh, the, the question is addressed to me, um, which is odd because I think uh, a, a few others are better versed to speak to this. And I think you already have, right? So both, uh, both Carrie Ann and Victor have already sort of alluded to capacity building also in the sense of, of knowledge of international law, et cetera. But, um, uh, how do we make this? How do we make this global? So, would anyone like to comment on that? If I if I may, then is because sure. I'm, I'm I need to uh, also uh, switch off and and go to another meeting. Beauty of uh, of uh, teleworking. Uh, very briefly, I think that you know I, I mean our approach, and I think that uh, Carrie Ann will probably uh, probably uh, say uh, uh, something similar, is that our approach from the European Union is that our capa cyber capacity building programs and trainings are global in its nature. And we very much support also GFC, Global Forum on uh, Cyber Expertise, which are global of nature, uh, to, uh, to precisely look beyond uh, our region, uh, to uh, engage uh, you know, uh, all, the, uh, all the other regions, be it in Africa, be it in Asia, um, uh, Asia Pacific, and also uh, Americas. Uh, uh, and supporting and collaborating with OES in that regard. So, so, uh, and I think that you know, the, the more actors uh, do it, the better it is to uh, to also increase uh, amount uh, and availability of such uh, such resources. So, very short uh, answer to a uh, to right question. And Thank you very much. And if Area? I may, then it's just to add to what Victor said. I think generally. At the OAS, we partner with a lot of our member states that have even um, better frameworks educationally because we make a distinction between awareness raising and education, which is a part of our overall capacity building. Um, because we break it up into three tiers. We have the awareness raising component, the technical component, where you actually give persons the technical skills needed to address cyber threats. And when we partner with them, for example, with the US government and NICE framework, we kind of look at the NICE framework, which speaks about a career track in cybersecurity and being able to plot where the educational gaps might be for our member states to be able to start thinking about how they fill this. And to go back to our national cybersecurity policies, we also encourage our member states to have a specific track on education. And we believe if each member state or each country begin to do that cross-pollination, of educational resources, it will become more a global thing as well. And along the lines that Victor already highlighted with the GFC. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think I'm gonna uh, stop it there. We've, we've run over time, we were allowed, so that is nice. Um, but also, I mean, uh, Victor has to step out as well and otherwise we're gonna end up with a, a, a panel that sort of bleeds, that's not a good thing. Um, I want to thank you all uh, very much uh, for your contribution, uh, Victor, Carrie Ann, Ayun, and also Heli. Um, thank you to uh, Patrick Pollock and uh, the team at uh, EU Cyber Direct for uh, putting this all together. Um, thank you for listening in. Uh, apologies for the technology gap that we had to solve along the way, but uh, this is uh, the reality of, uh, of teleworking and teleconferencing. Um, I wish you all uh, a very good day and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Goodbye. Thanks, Dennis. Excellent job. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay.